Okay, so uh, it's almost a one and a half centuries long journey, uh, starting with a lot of theoretical formulations for the gravitational waves, of course, followed by Einstein's famous formulation of general relativity. And then there were, following the theoretical formulations, of course, there were a lot of attempts to detect these gravitational waves experimentally. Some of the earliest, which started happening just after 1950s, Professor John Weber, whom you can actually see over here, this was a cylinder which he <laughs> wanted to use to detect the gravitational waves. And uh, actually, there was an indirect evidence of gravitational waves long back in the 1970s. And that indirect uh, evidence of gravitational radiation actually came from a binary pulsar system. It's, it's called the Hulse and Taylor pulsar system. And it was observed that this binary pulsar system, which was supposed to be gravitationally bound, the, the periodicity of this system was gradually increasing, the orbit shrinking gradually, which is supposed to be <coughs> gravitational emissions. It, it mapped the theoretical predictions of gravitational emissions from the theory of relativity. And that was reported as supported the first ever evidence of gravitational work. And only it was an invariant evidence, and we were still to observe the actual changes in space time that are caused by the gravitational radiation. And this direct detection came in 2015 by the LIGO collaboration, where there was a direct detection of the short wavelength gravitational waves. The short wavelength gravitational waves means gravitational waves which have a wavelength of the kilometers order. Or if you convert to frequency, it tends to hundreds of hertz. That is the order of frequencies that we had detected using LIGO and Virgo. Yeah. Very recently, there uh, has been, uh, I should say, the first emerging evidence. Why I'm calling it emerging, why are we calling it a hint? I'll explain later. But the first emerging evidence of long wavelength gravitational waves, a uh, uh, background of uh, long wavelength gravitational waves, it came up from ETA, the Pulsar Timing Array experiments, very recently, last year in June, on June 25th. Okay. So, by long wavelength gravitational waves, the wavelengths that we are referring to here, are on the order of light years. Okay. So what we have detected, what we have detected so far using LIGO and Virgo falls in this region, where the frequency of the gravitational waves, the ripples in space time themselves, fall of the order of 10 to hundreds of hertz. Okay. And these are supposed to emerge from the merger, the coalescence of neutron stars, black holes, or neutron black holes, uh, neutron star black hole binaries, and so on. And the wavelengths of gravitational wave emission at the moment of these binary mergers is calculated to be order of kilometers. So if you want to detect those uh, ripples, the changes in the dimensions of your detector due to such ripples, your detector has to have an arm length of zero of the order, which has to be of the order of kilometers, of course. And that is what we have in these detectors at Livingston and Hanford, the LIGO and the Virgo detectors. So using those detectors, the, uh, the first direct gravitational wave detection was made, and there is still detection which is going on. Uh, the next data we use is going to come out very soon. And uh, so th this is what was detected. Now, what is coming up are now not terrestrial detectors like these ones which are here on Earth, but space-based detectors like LISA, which uh, most of you might be knowing that got an approval very recent, recently. So using INSA, we are going to be able to detect gravitational waves that have a low frequency in the approximately in the order of many years. Okay. Now those gravitational waves are supposed to have an origin also in these binary uh, coalescence, but these uh, these waves that we have already detected, these are like the uh, waves that are generated at the near end of the coalescence. But here with Lisa, we should be able to look at the stellar mass compact binaries, which are yet to merge, like which are binary systems that are still revolving around each other. And also the merging moments of supermassive black holes, the moments when supermassive black holes collide. Okay. So that is about Lisa. It is yet to come up. We have to wait for that. But the interesting thing is, you know, jumping across this entire gap, nature has actually gifted us with some fantastic tools using which we can detect gravitational waves 
that has a frequency of the order of nanohertz. So nanohertz means the wavelength itself of these gravitational waves is, is the order of light years. So you can imagine that if you want to detect the dimensional changes due to space-time ripples that have the uh, length of the order of light years, then the arm length of your detector has to be of the order of light years. And you, you, you won't, you are, of course, you can't make those detectors on Earth even in space. Okay. So, but in some sense, nature has gifted up with such a detector, which is there in space. And that detector uh, is basically dead stars, neutron stars, which are highly magnetized and spinning very rapidly. These are called pulsars, or more precisely, the second pulsars. I'll come to that how we use these tools to detect or try to detect these animals gravitation. Okay. All right. Um, So, uh, since the object of interest today is nanohertz gravitational waves, let me give you a very brief background of the sources, the astrophysical sources that we know of these uh, long wavelength gravitational waves. So, the sources, the astrophysical sources that are uh, uh, that are predicted to give off these kind of long wavelength gravitational wave radiations are essentially supermassive black hole binaries. Now, these supermassive black hole binaries are formed during the merger of galaxies. At least from uh, whatever empirical evidences we have, now we know that every galaxy has a supermassive black hole at its center. Now, these galaxy merging events are happening always all around us, all over in the universe, across different red shifts, across different time scales. So with these galaxy mergers, of course, their central supermassive black hole, after you know, uh, the dissipation and everything happens because of dynamic friction and everything, the central black holes, they get locked as a gravitationally bounded pair. <clears throat> and this gravitationally bounded pair, when the distance between uh, these two centers is of the order of sub parsecs, then this purely gravitational bounded pair while orbiting around each other loses this rotational energy in the form of gravitational. And this gravitational radiation is observed for decades when these supermassive black holes are evolving around each other until they finally merge, at the moment of which you get a burst of gravitational radiation. Okay, so that has higher frequency, which I mentioned uh, can be observed by ESA when it is up. But in this phase, when it is still a few decades away from the nucleus, okay, and it is uh, anything in the gravitational wave spectrum of nanohertz frequencies. In this regime, we aim to detect these kind of gravitations using the pulsar timing. The pulsar timing array is sensitive in this particular window. Okay, you see there's a very small window here also, but I'll come to that later if you have interest. Okay. Now, there is a small problem here. When we talk about one single source, Okay. When we talk about one particular single source of this uh, long wavelength gravitational wave radiation, it's the, the power of that emission falls below the sensitivity of the pulsar time in that experiments. So as of now, using the PT experiments, it is not possible to detect a single source of this uh, uh, light year long gravitational wave radiation. Okay. So instead of that, what we do is that we use a complete ensemble of sources. Now, how and what, what would be the signature of these ensemble of sources? I'm coming to that. So the picture is more or less like this, where you have a collection of merging galaxies, each with its supermassive uh, black hole, uh, locked in a binary gravitationally bound pair. And these different pairs of supermassive black holes are emitting in the long wavelength gravitational wave spectrum. And what we expect to observe is a superposition of the gravitational emissions from all these particles. So essentially, the superposition is going to give you something of a persistent stochastic background, a background of space-time ripples that is always varying in, in, in the stochastic manner. And this uh, background will have the uh, your wavelength of the uh, your frequencies of the nanohertz gene 
And this superposition is something that would fall into the EPS axis. So this is what we are targeting to detect as well. Well, uh, if you have any questions, do ask, interrupt me and ask. Ask a question for everybody. Ask me for them. Bang like a jigsaw with tomorrow's show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the middle, jigsaw with tomorrow's show. Okay. So, uh, as I mentioned, so if you have a collection of supermassive black hole binary pairs, everything uh, these gravitational wave radiations in the uh, uh, nanometers region. And if you try to uh, find out the superposition, the, the spectral index of the superposition of all these signals, then it turns out that in case your sources are exclusively astrophysical origin, that is supermassive black hole binaries, in that case, you will find a particular relationship between the power of the gravitational wave that is emitted with the frequency of that emission. Okay, and that spectral index turns out to be of a particular value. Which is minus two by three. So, which you can see on but, this plot. Well, yes. So, Pratik, you said that if it's of an astrophysical origin, so you are effectively thinking just supermassive black hole parts by the right? Yes. yes. But then, mm -hmm. uh, to get the spectrum mm -hmm. on this, this power law, mm -hmm. the, the, the power of the you know, string, mm -hmm. uh, you must have some model. There must be some modeling of uh, supermassive black hole populations yes. and all that stuff. Yes. So that, oh, do you know what, what kind of... So, yeah, so this this is basically, so for that, of course, first we have to know what is the distribution of these merging galaxies in the universe. Correct. And that is, theoretically, that is given by this particular function where you have the number of merging pairs per unit rate, per unit mass and all, all this, uh, mass ratios and everything. Now, this is not calculated theoretically, right? And this is derived or wanted rather, from various gametic surveys that we have. So mm -hmm. using the different narrative surveys, there are models of the distribution. And uh, I don't know exactly which model uh, gives what. But using such models, which are derived from the dialectic surveys, we uh, derive this, this uh, occupation function. And using that occupation function, it has been found that we, we get a particular well. So So how Roma asked is that? I mean, minus, because you know, these models yes. have yeah. uh, Lot of things because there are people in this room who are actually working on this exactly. kind of occupation models. Yes. So how robust is the index for the frequency? Well, uh, there is always a scope for errors in these uh, spectral indexes, as you can see in this plot itself. So the two by three is basically this dot. So in case all these distributions, not only the occupation function, there are other things also. Exactly. So, in the uh, so suppose you have supermassive black hole binary pair, we assume that it is perfectly straight, uh, circular. It may not. There could be eccentricities and all that stuff, all those combinations. So, that would again uh, introduce uh, other functions in this particular thing. So, if you have a distribution of these kind of models and eccentricities, then what you find is a region of uncertainty between which your spectral index can vary. So two thread is like so it is uh, it is the uh, the limit of the deterministic index that you can have. But using various kinds of models, so here you see this this thing the FID, this is the model and it's a great model as you can see. So using different kinds of models, you can get a distribution of this spectral index. But this two by three, as you can see, this is like one of the bounds of that spectrum. Now, this is, uh, these are the things that we have to investigate when we have uh, confirmed, you know, detection of these things. So at that point, we can study different kinds of models of the galaxy distribution, different kinds of models of extensions. And of course, we do not know, like the, as I said, in order to form a gravitational bound system, first the uh, supermassive black holes have to come to this sub region. What happens before it comes to the sub region is something we do not understand. Uh, there are these things, the stellar scattering and viscosity, all kinds of dissipation happening over there. So those things might also change, change. change the index to some extent, and that is something that we have to invest in. Any other questions? Okay, so one thing is uh, clear from uh, the question raised by Richard Gandhi is that there are a lot of assumptions in the theoretical models that we have, which lead to this kind of spectral index. 
So we assume a continuous distribution of these uh, binary spinosic black hole pairs. There could be hundreds of modules of that. And we also assume other geomet geometrical assumptions are being made, like circular pairs and all that. It has to be completely gravitationally bound so that, so that the radi radiation is exclusive, exclusively gravitationally bound. So these are some of the assumptions that are there to give us an upper bound on the spectral index of these kind of gravitational wave radiations. Okay, so this is one of the first criteria. Okay, so if you have a PT experiment running, and suppose we have um, these signals for decades, we have collected these signals, and we see that if you do a spectral analysis of those signals, you see that you have a spectral index which is obeying uh, that particular distribution, whatever we had, falls into that distribution. But is that the only confirmatory evidence of stochastic gravitation? The answer is no. That is only one of them. There is another. And that criteria, in order to understand that criteria, we have to understand the tools of our detection. Now, these tools of our detection, as I said, these are some extremely precise clocks that are gifted to us by nature. These are called pulsars. Okay. And these pulsars, as you all might know, these are highly magnetized neutron stars that are spinning on their orbit. They are emitting, they are, they are on a very broad band. Okay. But what emission we are interested in are the radio emissions which occur from the poles of this uh, uh, neutron stars, pulsars. Okay, this highly collimated beams of radio emissions from the poles, and depending on the line of uh, depending on how these beams are cutting your line of sight, you can see these kind of flashes of radio beams cutting across your instrument. Uh, known as the cosmic lighthouse effect, as you can see, when this beam cuts across your line of sight, you get, get a radio pulse, thus giving this name, uh, this object the name pulsar. Okay. Now, the pulsars, there are different kinds of pulsars. Okay? So, as of today, I can tell you that there are around 3,500 known pulsars, approximately. If the number is increasing every day. Now, okay, maybe with uh, some radio telescopes like fast demonstration. Okay. But as of now, we have say 3,500 pulsars known. And out of those pulsars, there are young pulsars and then there are old pulsars. Okay. By young pulsars, I mean those pulsars which have very high magnetic fields and you know long periods of rotation in the order of seconds. Okay, the, the longest known, I think, as of now is around 19 um, seconds or something. something. And so these are these have periodicities in the order of seconds, and the the rate of the decay of their spin for young pulsars is also higher. That is, they spin down faster. Okay. But then there is another category of pulsars, which are old pulsars that have periodicities in the order that is a period of rotation along uh, uh, on their axis is of the order of milliseconds. So these pulsars. Uh, spin thousands of times every second on their axis, and the decay rate of their periodicities is much smaller compared to the younger pulsars. Which means that the, uh, the the periodicity of these pulsars, the older pulsars, are much stable than the younger pulsars, and also the periodicity is higher in these cases. Now, these older pulsars are essentially what we call rejuvenated pulsars. Or spun up pulsars. So what happened is that you know the neutrons are already they are dead stars. Okay. Now these neutron stars, which uh, turned out to be pulsars, started radiating and all that, and they start they also spun down rapidly. And after some point of time, they start they they, they stopped emitting these radio emissions. They went in the dead zone of the pulsars. Okay. But in some cases, it could so happen that there was a companion. It, it, it found a companion, and from that companion, it put a creep matter, thus accreting more angular momentum on the surface, thus spinning up again. So these kind of pulsars, whose pores are now much more stable since they are old, the younger pulsars are, you know, their core is unstable. Older pulsars more mature, more you know, stable pores. So these older pulsars, which have stable pores, that means there are less variations in their periodicities. So, since you're going to be mentioning glitches, okay? 
So these glitches are actually characteristics of younger persons. Where the core is still very unstable, we do not understand the core of the pulsar yet. And the periodicities of the pulsars can change drastically. Some of these younger pulsars can spin up and then again you get to their normal periodicities and all that. So all these instabilities are happening in the younger pulsars. Whereas these older pulsars, which are called millisecond pulsars, these pulsars have a very stable core. So their periodicities are stable. The spin down rate is lower. Okay, so they can rotate stably for decades or hundreds of years, okay, which is the window that we require for our pulsar time unit experiments. And also, as the core is stable, so their profiles in different radio frequencies are also more stable compared to the younger persons. Now, in pulsar time unit experiments, we have to observe a pulsar for 10s, 15s, 20s, 30s of years. Okay, so if our pulsar is not stable, if the profile is not stable, if it is changing, okay, if the periodicity is not very stable, if if you are unable to measure the difference in the arrival times of these pulses to as much precision as the order of nanoseconds, then you won't be able to detect these two types stochastic gravitational wave background. And this detection, this collection of data has to happen over a scale of decades. Because the supermassive binaries from which supposedly we are getting this background don't have a, a rotational period of decades. <laughs> okay. So, uh, you see one thing. So, first of all, in this plot here, by P0 and P1, you mean the time period of the pulsar and the rate of change of time period of the pulsar. Yes. P and P dot or something. And also, I mean, I understand that with the binary companion, things can be different. Hmm. But for non-binary pulsars, the period is increasing slowly. So it is becoming slower. Yes. So young pulsars should have, I mean, if you just take the non-binary pulsars, then young pulsars should have shorter time period, and then the that should slowly become larger. But that is here in your view cluster of points. So there, there the time I and mean, the variation is not. Obviously, it cannot be clear. It may be zoomed in or something, but I mean, for millisecond pulsars, it's different because the binary component is changing their trend. But general trend for pulsars is that as time progresses, the pulsar becomes slower yes. because the rotational energy is going into radiation. So, young pulsars should have shorter period and older pulsars should have longer period. After some point, they are so the relationship will be so more so it will be yes. yes. Yes, but uh, ah, so you are right. Now the thing is these millisecond pulsars they were not millisecond pulsars to start with. That's correct. Younger pulsars of the periodicity of the of sinus. Right. Exactly the using the procedure which you said, following that procedure, they went into the dead zone. That's okay. But then some of these dead pulsars right. they could uh, acquire material from some companion that was passing by and which led them to spin up. You know, so again, giving them a uh, period of sitting which is much lower than seconds. But as I said, it's uh, from the region that it has uh, acquired this material, also the whole is stable. So the rate of decay of this spun up uh, pulsar yeah. is smaller than yeah. the pulsars. And they again start uh, radiating as they come into this life cycle. Yes. So, what is my, uh, you know, I apologize for my lack of knowledge of pulsars. No, but this is, pulse. yeah, yeah. So, these are, um, <laughs> so is it, is it true that Kamal Prof is used that all the millisecond pulsars are actually older pulsars? Yes. Yes. So, those are the ones who had companion. Uh, well, is it necessary that all millisecond pulsars would have companion? If if we, be, if if we believe in this origin story of millisecond pulsars, yeah. then every millisecond pulsar should have been But the millisecond pulsars that we use in our pulsar timing experiment, some of those millisecond pulsars are actually isolated. Isolated. Yes. So how do we know isolated? Yes. Now that now if you the thing is so those probably are younger pulsars, which are isolated. Maybe they will go there and no, probably they are media from their competition. Uh, what's going on? It's gone. The company is gone. Now, how do we do not know? It's pretty stable. Like your P1 is pretty low for those, those people. Yes. So, yes. All of them fall here. 
So this is actually not a, I, I can't uh, draw this plot interactively, but there are other pulsars. So there's a the green ones are binary. Yes. And the red ones the have a binary. So that's 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 I mean, you can expect that definitely, but uh, but you know, they have different physical processes going on. I mean, it's not for you know, the high energy pulsars are the it's a different kind, of, and the blue are just a scattered point. But I think we're going to go on them. So, there is there is there is a correlation, you're right? So, in law of you can see it's a kind of a correlation, but probably it's a power law. But uh, but again, in order to explain that power law, which would cover the phenomena that is going on beside the course of pulsars ranging from young to old. For that, you have to have a very, we need to have a very precise knowledge of the neutron star core itself. And you know that there are debates about the equation of space. We still do not know what the inside of a neutron star consists. Okay, and especially in these old ones, young ones uh, are a different story. Old ones are, in old ones, we still do not understand what are actually the initial mechanisms in this point. So there is a lot of mystery about the things themselves, but we won't go into those details. What we are interested in is in the properties of these uh, of these second pulsars, which we can utilize or exploit to our advantage. Okay, and that is the stability, as I said, stability of rotation and the stability of the magnetosphere of the core of the profile. Okay, so uh, how do we use this millisecond pulsars to detect the gravitation? As I said, these millisecond pulsars are placed in others are mostly our galactic pulsars and they are placed uh, light years across here and there. So you select a particular ensemble of pulsars and you start observing the pulse arrival signals from each of these pulsars. And then, of course, for that particular pulsar, we will have a predicted time of arrival of the pulsar or pulse. So what you see is that whether there is a deviation from your predicted pulse arrival time with the actual pulse arrival time which you are observing. Mm -hmm. And this, so when you do that, you will find that there is actually a deviation which is varying with time. Either there is a consistent trend or sometimes it could be a stochastic trend as well. So these variations are what we call as timing residuals. So when, basically you are measuring the pulse arrival time of your pulse. That is what is the art of pulsar timing. And when you are trying to measure the difference between your, between your predicted pulse arrival time and your actual observed pulse arrival time, this timing residual is something that you would expect to vary following a particular pattern if you know all the reasons behind this discrepancy between the modern arrival time and the actual arrival. Okay, so the various reasons that are known to cause these discrepancies this is because, as I said, these are very precise laws. Ideally, we should not expect any delay in the actual arrival time and the model. Time. But there are delays. What are these delays? The known sources could be at the source of emission itself. Neutron stars are highly compact objects, they curve the space time. Right? So there would be delays in the signals that would be coming from the space time curvature. Immediately across them, and then it would be different if it is an isolated or if it is fine. So you will have all of these kinds of emissional delays from the source, and if it is a binary, you will have uh, from the binary component as well. But these you can calculate from the theory of gravitation. These are well known deterministics. Okay. Now forget about this for the time. Okay. You have the solar system itself. The uh, signal, the radio signal, has to travel all these distances. And of course, there are these heavy Jovian planets in the solar system, like Jupiter and Saturn, which will again cause these kind of effects. What it will do is that it is actually shifting the band center of solar system. So the solar system band center is not actually at the center of the solar system. It will keep varying every year. And that would depend on how these heavy, mostly these heavy planets are moving. So for that, you need to have a very precise ephemeris. Of your solar system, which is provided and updated every year by the NASA JPL. 
So you will use this ephemeris to actually calculate where the bearing center of the solar system is. And using that, you have to calculate uh, the uh, actual DA which you are measuring on Earth. <laughs> so those are the solar system details. And of course, your clock itself. So you are observing these signals at an observatory, a radio observatory on Earth. And for us, it is the GMRT. So there, that observatory will have a clock. Now that clock will have its own variations. Now, when, when we say variations, we are talking of variations of the order of nanoseconds. So you have irregularities in Earth's rotation itself. You know, for that, we have to add leap seconds and all that. So irregularities in the rotation of the Earth has to be accounted for. And of course, the rotation itself has to be accounted for. The revolution of the Earth around the Sun has to be accounted for and all, all that stuff. So these are, all these delays are contributing. But what I want to emphasize is these delays are known. You can either calculate them theoretically or you can obtain them from the data, updated data which is available. Okay. But there are other delays which act as the devil in this sense. The most, most notorious of them is something called DM, which or dispersion measure. Now, this dispersion measure is actually coming from the oceans of IS and the interstellar medium that this signal has to. You know that if there is an electromagnetic signal traveling through uh, an ionized medium, then as per the dispersion law, the old dispersion law, it will uh, it will suffer some kind of a delay in the arrival time. That is because of the change in the refractive index of the medium, and that has a dependence on the frequency of the signal traveling through itself. That is the dispersion, right? So obeying that dispersion law, of course, if your medium is ionized, which of course it is, it's a sea of electrons that it has to cross. So, and these radio signals are traveling through that ionized medium, as per dispersion, they will suffer. So that delay again is deterministic. Okay, you have you know the dispersion relation and you can obtain a relation between how the delay would depend on the frequency of the radio signal. But the assumption there is that the ISM is stable, it is stationary, which is not. You do not know how the ISM is changing along the line of it's, it's heavily dynamic. So that when you consider that dynamics of the ISM, then things start getting difficult. Okay? And if this is exactly where the Indian experiment or the Indian PTA helps to filter out the ISM components. I will come to it in more detail later. So once you are able to figure out all these deterministic delays, once you are able to figure out the ISM details, then what you are left with is expected to be the delay in the arrival due to this stochastic variation. Um, questions? So you are saying it's delay. But is it always delayed or it's also hard? Sometimes. Uh, it's always negative. It's it's, it's a delay. It's, it's, it's not early. It's not early. It's a delay. So if, if you delay, if you mention it with respect to the previous parts, Correct. Right. Some some good response. Yeah. But uh, whatever is coming with the certain period, it mm -hmm. will come early at that, that period or delay that. But I guess that I know. If there are nothing in between, then there is no value. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. For the system. Um, it's a movie. So, mm -hmm. if you see the Jovian planets are moving mm -hmm. versus moving toward. So I I I understand. The thing is, if you are talking about the actual physical uh, mechanism which is happening, physically it is a delay. But if you are considering solar system, that is the bearing center, then it is relative to the clock that you are measuring. So it's about your measure. So if you are, if there are these clock corrections that are not accounted for, then it will seem sometimes you are correct. It will seem sometimes the signal is right. But when you do the clock corrections, you see. Because it's just that, as you said, that yeah. it depends on what you take as your zero. Everything else has to be positive. If there is nothing in between, then what is that? What is the earth? For example, the earth is rotating around. 
So the card between the pulsar and earth is changing. And that is also we are talking about nano second dynasty. So isn't it okay? That's so, okay. No, so they, they are uh, uh, mixed up the arm with the solar system dynamics, which is dating so the meeting and has direction and correct. So when we are measuring the uh, arrival arrival time, then the arrival time is the final arrival time that we measure to calculate the receivers. That is between the pulsar and the barycenter of the solar system. So that, as correctly pointed out, so if that barycenter correction is not done, then it it may appear as arriving early also. But what we measure is of course what we are measuring on Earth. We have to translate it to the solar system barycenter time. So when we do that using all these corrections, it's it's obvious. So the rotation is going to also change yes. the barycenter. Yes. So that has to be also accounted for. So accounting for all that, it's a yeah. okay. ah, so uh so I was just lost there. So anyway, sorry. So the thing is we have talked about the first criteria, which was the spectral units. Okay. So why I explain all these things? That is because in order to understand the second and the final most important criteria, we need to understand these delay mechanisms. So you have a pulsar, you have the signal coming in. And the delays in the observed medium, filtering out known delays, we get the uh, delays that are left into gravitation. So once, suppose we have already filtered out all the known sources of delays, and we are left only with the delays due to the gravitational wave background. If that is the case, then even then, if you have this delay only from a single uh, millisecond pulsar, it will fall into the sense, which I also mentioned earlier. So you need an ensemble of millisecond pulsars, and then you measure the delays due to only gravitational waves from all these different directions. And when you do that, if these delays from all the different directions are due to a common perturbation in between, then these should be correlated instances. Okay, you have delay from here, delay from there, delay from there, due to a common origin in between. If that is the case, then this final region is all around, it has a relation, okay? The radiation background, it has some mathematical form, some theoretical form, or whatever. So that is causing delays from all the directions. So the delay, multi-direction delays themselves should have a correlation between them depending on their separation instance. So this spatial correlation between the delays should have a particular form which is known as Helling's and Downs correlation. This was predicted in 1980s. Theoretically. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Because it's a space time stretching and squeezing. Ah, uh, yes. So it should be coming faster and slower while it's delayed on this. So it's not always positively arousing. You see the heading down star. Okay, so you are saying the space itself is squeezing, so distances from the so proper distances changing. That's why you are getting to be the time value to be time changing. Yes. So why is doing this? Probably we are talking about the space. Yeah, so I'm not the why. So yes, and I think you know, Pratik and just normally both that sort of we So yes, that, that has also to has to do with the scale of how the gravitational wave is also propagating. So I think if it's squeezing, then probably at the scale that it switch, it's doing the squeezing and stretching, that late scale probably is, is much larger than the scales at which I am looking at the pulsars in different directions. No, this is the baseline. Pulsar distance is the baseline distance is like uh, of the order of nine years. Yes. yes. Well, comparable with that. With the radiant pulsar. Yes. But, uh, and, but this is not... So then mm -hmm. you have defined frequency gravitation. So, so it's not uh, migration of the term with that argument. So it's not obvious to me. 
Yes, so you would be expecting some kind of interference patterns like that you see in Michelson. Yeah, yeah. And in our case, it's okay. So in our case, that pattern comes up in the form of these spatial coordinations. Spatial coordination, I can understand because the gravitational motion is traveling. Yes. So when it is uh, acting on a one person, to right. that Different time with the other person, right? And this would be good. Right. So, 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 Actually, there are many kinds of residuals. These residuals, of course, these residuals are you know distributed in like positive and negative. So some reference value. Okay. So those kind of residuals that you have from all these pulsars along different directions, that should obey particular spatial correlation. If the source of those residuals are the stochastic gravitational wave background, as we can model from the uh, known sources. So. Uh, Around uh, four years back, when nanograph in America, they come up, came out with one, one of their data releases, so 12 and a half years data release. So there, they have claimed that they are seeing the minus two third, sort of, you know, with some confidence level, gravitation over spectrum. Okay? But that was still not a detection because that data was unable to show this patient correlation. Now, in the latest results that we have, we are now able to see independently from the data of different pulsar time areas, we are able to see both the spectral signature as well as the helix and downs correlation, the spatial correlation with some confidence level within some statistics. Okay, so uh, maybe uh, how much time do I have? Thank you, Chakanadi. Uh, uh, 10 minutes? Yeah, 15 15 minutes. minutes? Okay. okay. So, okay, so I'll just get this. So, this is basically to demonstrate two uh, condis conditions are essential. Okay, so the IPT. So, what is the instrument? Uh, so, the of course, radio pulsars are our instruments, but the detectors that we have on Earth, those are from a group which is called the International Pulsar Timing Array, of which now we have uh, data from what's this? From, okay, so we have a thing about. Are you trying the uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. It was working from the thing. Just take one as usual. It doesn't stop. Yeah, maybe it has stopped. Okay, okay. no problem. Yes. So we have data from uh, Nanograph, which is coming from the RSCO receiver, which is not there anymore, but there is old data which uh, we have used. There is the ring back telescope and some VLA data is also there. The chime data, which is in the low frequency uh, radio uh, regime, that has yet to be pulled. Okay, so the present nanograph data is coming from RC1 GPUs. Then you have five receivers in Europe that consist the European pulsar timing array. We have data from this, these are around 24 years of data for 25 millisecond pulsars. The nanograph is the largest sample of 67 millisecond pulsars with their data for 15 years. Then we have the Australian pulsar timing array, or the PARC pulsar timing array, as it is called. With 30 millisecond pulsars and 18 years of data, we have the Indian pulsar time index, which is the youngest member of the IPTA. And, uh, and now it has almost seven years of data with 20 millisecond pulsars. And we also expect the South African mean cat pulsar timing array or DAP to be joined IPTA very soon. There's a Chinese pulsar timing array which is using the 500 meter aperture spherical telescope. Uh, and they also have published their results independently. Okay. So the EPTA, as I said, the, the unique strength of the Indian pulsar timing analysis, that was uh, one of the, the second part of my talk to establish what is the Indian contribution in the results. The contribution is that, as I said, so in those timing procedures, the most notorious thing to measure are the ISM variations. Now, these ISM variations are prominent at the lower frequency end of the radio signals. Okay? Because the dispersion, the, the delay in the signal due to the dispersion from the ISM is inversely proportional to the frequency of the signal that is traveling. So the lower in radio frequency you go, the more you are able to measure these uh, deviations from the ISM. Okay? And that is where 
in the upgraded giant meter wave uh, radio telescope in India operates. It operates at the lower frequency regions with the other radio telescopes that have pulled in data till now do not operate at. And then, hence, with our higher sensitivity at the low radio frequencies, the UGMRT is ideal for studying the frequency dependent effects in the pulsar uh, time arrival signal. So, this uh, is an old experiment which was conceived in 2015. We have data from the GMRT and also from the UTO radio telescope, which we have not pulled in yet. And presently, we are actually observing almost 27 pulsars. So this is, this is an older slide, actually, at a cadence of 10 to 14 days. So we observe our pulsars every approximately every two weeks, 10 days to two weeks. And of course, we have plans to extend into more pulsars in the future, because the more samples you have in the sky, that means you are sampling more angular separations, which makes it easier uh, to get uh, a heavy cell down correlation with the higher position. Okay, so I will just say a few words for this. So, as I said, low frequency operation is essential for ISMDA. There is something else as well. That is, the GMRT actually consists of 30 dishes, okay, each with 45 meter diameter, distributed with the longest baseline being 25 kilometers. So, these 30 antenna can actually observe the same source in different frequencies. So that is uh, different radio frequencies. That is one of the unique features. So you can group these antenna into four different sub arrays, maximum four different sub arrays, and with each of these sub arrays can actually work as an independent radio source. So you can observe the same source in say 300 to 500 megahertz, and the same source is in a different sub array in one one gigahertz to two gigahertz like that. Okay? So you have signals coming in at different frequencies, and why that is important. That is important because when you have so so this is actually the this is this is the first one so so the previous is this question the or the investigative law or this question law yeah, yeah. so uh, why is that simultaneous measurement at different radio frequencies important it is important because if you have the data at this particular end of the frequency, and you also have the data, the delay data, at a higher end of the frequency, then you can fit this particular model across a longer range of frequencies to get a better estimate of the dispersion measure. This dispersion measure is essentially the density of electrons in the ISM along your line of sight. It is the integrated common density of the electrons along the lines of the okay. So if you have data only in this region and you are trying to fit for the DM, you'll get a uh, value of the DM, but of course the precision will be lower. Okay. If you have data only in this region, okay, again you can fit for DM, but the precision will be lower. If you have data in this region and this region, but they are obtained on in different times, not simultaneous. Then you can still fit for it, but again the decision would be lower, not very correct. Right? But if you have data in this regime and this regime obtained simultaneously, and then you fit for the uh, dispersion model, then the precision of DM that you get is highest. And UGMRT is the only telescope right now in the world which has this unique feature of dividing into sub arrays and observing the same target simultaneously and at low frequencies. Okay, so this. Is but well, this is something that I will just skip. This is regarding the dynamics of the ISM again, because the dispersive delay is you know deterministic, you know, it's one by s. But then the ISM itself is dynamic, there is turbulence there. And if you make assumptions regarding the model of the turbulence, like we assume it's a full model of turbulence, in that case, you can derive some sort of a frequency dependence of the uh, arrival signal delays. But then that is an assumption, and that has to be folded in in your data so that you can filter out the gravitation. So using low frequency data, we can also study the scattering effects better and filter them. Okay, so this is exactly what I was telling. So in the UJMRP, you have residuals, the timing residuals at lower frequencies of 300 to 500 gigahertz. You also have residuals, sign state, simultaneously obtained timing residuals at uh, say 1000 or 1500 gigahertz, and you can fit them to obtain the most precise 
DM estimates that have been obtained. This is the first data release of the Indian Pulsar Time in a way, which came out in October 2022. And this is the data which has been pulled in from the NPT side to the International Pulsar Time in a combination. We have 40 millisecond pulsars. Of course, there are gaps in between. These are different UGMRT cycles. So this is like four years of data. So different UGMRT cycles where some pulsars were observed, some were not observed. And under the uh, setup as well. But mostly uh, the, the dispersion measure estimates that we have from these data, it gives a more or less clear picture of how these dispersion measures have varied over the years. And these variations are going to include the deterministic variations. These variations are also going to include the stochastic variations. That is the dynamics of this. And if you pull in this data to do the modeling of your actual DNA that are actually the damning residuals that are coming from all the PTAs, then you should be able to filter out the ISN effects better, thus you know, uh, trying to see the gravitational wave with a much higher significance. Okay, so I will just skip this. This is just the details of the NPTA data release that we had. Okay, so when you have the deterministic terms filtered or subtracted out, what you are left with is stochastic variations. Questions? Question? No, no, no. So you are left with the stochastic variations. And those stochastic variations could be due to small variations in the pulsar itself, not glitches, of course, not the large variation as glitches, but even in millisecond pulsars, you have very minor irregularities. We call them timing noise or spin noise. Okay. So we have to model for these uh, spin noise or timing noise. Then there are, of course, the ISM noise. There could be variations in the DM. There, there could be variations in the scattering in the DM. So scattering is essentially it is like an analog of the twinkling that you see in stars and This is just twinkling in twinkling. So you have the scattering variations, and also there could be other uh, type of variations that you cannot model. And at least now we do not know what we can. Model. So we set them as p parameters there in the Mendelian noise modeling, and using the data, the data what we have earlier when we did not have the UGMRT data, when there was like only the nanogravity PTA and the PTA data. We were able to constrain these noises, the white noise and at most the DM variations. Okay. So for DM variations, we have like 15 years of data and so on. So you can somehow constrain them. But when we put in the low frequency data here, we are now able to constrain even the scattering and the free chromatic noise variations. Okay. And that is what is basically the Indian contribution here. Okay. So when what we did from the NPT is that we combine the Indian data with the European Pulsar Time data. The European Pulsar Time data, data is a data of 24 years. And Indian data is only of four years till now. But then, since it's lower frequency, you can constrain these DM things very well. And the time baseline of the Indian PT and the European PT are mostly complement. So when you combine them, you are able to see, so here in these plots, the gray plots which you see are essentially posterior from only EPTA data. Okay. <laughs> so you can see these bimodalities in some of the parameters, mostly red noise parameters, which are the ISM parameters. Okay. So when you combine the EPTA data with this European uh, PTA data, you see that these ISM parameters are constrained far better. Okay. So this is essentially what the NPTA data did in the combination. And using that combination, EPTA and NPTA uh, independently announced their joint results for the spectral index, as well as the Helms and Downs distribution. However, the significance would obviously have to increase. The significance that was reported in the EPTA plus NPTA data is around 3 to 3.5 sigma. And there were simultaneous announcements from all the other PTAs as well. Nanograd made the same uh, announcement with a higher significance. They have around 3.5 to 4 sigma. The Australian PT also did the same announcement with a bit of a lower significance around 2 sigma. Now, each, each of the individual PTS can, uh, you know, uh, they are capable of doing this detection to the, the, the holy grail of 5 sigma significance. But for that, you have to do uh, observations for another decade or so. But there is another way of increasing the significance, and that is to combine all of these data. So you have a greater sample of pulses. So the PTAs which are there in the northern hemisphere, they are, they are only able to see some of the pulses. The southern hemisphere, the PTA, they are able to see some of the pulses. The Indian PTA is in a very sweet spot, which can see some of the northern and some of the southern pulses. 
Okay, so when you combine this entire sample, then obviously your sampling here is much better and you can expect a higher significance and that is what we expect. Presently, what we are doing is that we are combining all these data as we speak and we probably by the end of this year or maybe early next year, we expect that we would have uh, Helix and Brown significance and expected significance of around uh, 20 signals. So, so uh, I think I don't have much time. I will just say that what next? Okay, so we have some sort of a strong data which that is fine. But the uh, confirmed evidence will only come in a few months or maybe a year. But when that detection confirmed evidence comes, what is it that we are going to look for? And that one of the most important things there is to look at the sources of this stochastic background better. So as uh, Shujana at the very beginning of the talk that you pointed out, so the astrophysical sources themselves need to be characterized. <clears throat> so for that, we will also need to be able to detect the individual sources. Right now, we are not detecting the individual sources. We are detecting only the background. But with more and more data and higher resolution, higher sensitivity instruments like this square kilometer array coming up, we are actually proceeding towards the detection of individual sources. Once you have the individual sources detected, you can measure all these timing residuals from there much better in your sensitivity regime. And then, if you can tweak the model of your uh, astrophysical systems, you'll be able to constrain the astrophysical parameters accordingly. Then we can study the eccentricities, then we can study the various uh, character distributions. Then, uh, sources, proposed sources as well, which have Cosmological origins. There are uh, there are propositions right now that the similar significant stochastic gravitational wave background could probably be generated from cosmological phase transitions, inflation scenarios, you know, domain walls, primordial black holes, dark matters. So there, there are cosmic strings. There are a lot of propositions right now which we uh, which we have to <laughs> investigate. And this will all come when we have the confirmed evidence of the background as well as a detection, confirmed detection of the sources. So this is something, it's, it's still an open field, and I believe uh, many interesting things will come up from there. So in summary, I think I am done. In summary, we have been uh, somewhat able to open a long wavelength window of additional gravitational phenomenon. And uh, in electromagnetic waves, you know, this whole spectrum, it took a very long time from optical to the high energy. In terms of gravitational waves, it has been a one and a half centuries journey so far. And of course, it, uh, there is a there is a way more to achieve. And the PTAs, the pulsar timing arrays, basically what they do is that they throw arrays of pulsars around similar of pulsars to look for this characteristic common red noise spectrum, which I don't and the spatial correlation or Helix and Downs correlation. The MPTA and the EPTA have combined the data for 20, 25 pulsars to reveal a significant evidence of the spectrum as well as the Helix and Downs correlation. Similar evidence is having suggested by other PTAs. Right now, we are combining uh, the data from all these PTAs, including the MeerCat PTA as well. They are also chiming in their data. So include combining the, all these data right now, we expect to come up with a higher significance evidence of the gravitational background. And yes, as we step into the new era of gravitational astronomy, we seek to prove alternative, alternate theoretical models of this cosmic gravitational background. Finally, I would like to thank all of you, and of course, we thank this wonderful team. This picture is from one of the uh, latest meetings that we had this February. So yeah, it's a very vibrant and wonderful team to work with, and all that I've learned over this last three years is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, since yes, <laughs> so uh, you said like P dot Asking like, uh, in that case, if we don't know properly in the P dots, mm. uh, then the magnetic field, like pulsar people measure magnetic fields from P and over this. So that magnetic field calculation would be wrong. Uh, so the way you measure these parameters, P and P dot, this one pulsar time itself. So, so there are steps. So when you have a pulsar, first you do a pulsar survey. So from this pulsar survey, you uh, report probable candidates that could be a pulsar. And you confirm that these are pulsars by measuring these timing residuals 
Okay, and from those timing residuals, you try to do the pulsar timing, and from there, you predict that uh, the amount of these residuals, the periodicity has to be this, the period derivative has to be this, and so on. If, if, if it's a binary, then this has to be the expensive video as well. And so these are the different assumptions that you have a particular model that accounts for this kind of residuals, and you try to fit that model to your data from that particular system. The candidate, of course, we have regular pulse, radio pulses. So, of course, it's a radio pulse candidate in that case. So, timing is what you need to constrain these parameters. And only after you constrain these parameters from your data using pulse timing, you use those to measure the magnetic field using the critical formula. So you, you, you say that magnetic field measurements are okay, not bad measurements. Well, from the measurements that we have for the millisecond pulsars as of now, EMP dot measured EMP dot millisecond pulsars, we find that millisecond, millisecond pulsars have a magnetic field which is at least three to four orders of magnitude lower than the young pulsars. So it's like 10 to the power 8, 10 to the power 9 goes, whereas the, uh, the younger ones are much higher than 10 to the power 8. So, uh, and that, that is expected from whatever theoretical model we have as of now of the neutron core, neutron star core. So the magnetic field is supposed to decay with time. And all we are spinning the pulsar up by acquisition of angular momentum, you are not changing the magnetic field. Some changes, of course, but not the core. There are not much changes to the core. So we would not expect the magnetic field to also go up. <laughs> so this is intuitive. But the actual measurements come only from the observations. Generally, P and P dot are well measured with very accurate measurements of P and P dot are available for bright pulsar. Unless you have some pulsar that is recently discovered at 2020, or some of the double pulsars where you are seeing the addition not from the pulse but from the pulsar with nebula. Yes. Other than those things, your pulsar seems having this accurate feeling is an important aspect of pulsars. So that automatically gives you that P and P dot are usually very well featured. And unless P and P dot are featured, you don't even talk to the pulse. This is not. No, but uh, well, we need the limit of millisecond. That, that is a particular. That is a particular. We need that in the period of period difference. Or the sun, or this delay, etc., they don't even matter because the pulsar delay continues at within the same place. So that's why its measurement is. In fact, other things are predicted from PNP, like the lifetime of the pulsar, etc. Uh, and that is the, you know, the, the, the basic thing that we can first measure. We have to derive it. And there are also assumptions like this. Yes, my Yeah, so that was, that was all that was a great talk. So my question was that when you were talking about the INPG results, so you talked about how like the separate channels of the geometry you have been able to construct different kinds of noises, for example, along with the the red noise, you have other you have other kinds of noise constraints as well. Mm -hmm. Um no, I think that right. 